Morning, everyone. Hopefully that break in between the general session and coming to this session wasn't too long and you managed to get a coffee. Thank you for coming. Um, what we're going to talk about today is how we're going to leverage or how we have leveraged or infrastructure as code to be able to automate not only what you could do to protect your existing application and workloads, but how we can actually use infrastructure as code to automate and orchestrate the whole Veeam deployment. Now we're using VMware on AWS to begin with, but ultimately this is portable to any um, VMware on AWS. So I'm Michael Cade, I'm a global technologist, part of the product strategy team. Hi, I'm uh, Niels Engeler, also part of global, uh, global technologist of product strategy at Veeam as well. So. so the majority of the session is going to be not so many slides and a lot of live demo. So what I need is everyone to cross their fingers and hope that this all goes without without a hitch. So uh, I think so. We're not DevOps guys. We're not developers. He he likes to think he is. He doesn't have a beard though. But um, I think this is definitely a, a new world, but a different change around automation and what we can do. And we're using exactly the same tool sets that we use day in day out. And all we're doing is extending the art of the possible and being able to drive a different outcome from that. So. If we jump in, because so what we've done is we're going to use VMware and AWS, as I said. We've got a very vanilla SDVC. For anyone in the room, has anyone in the room actually deployed VMware on AWS? Interesting. So we're using a, a, a single node in, in our SDVC, and it will spin out, it will spin out all the NSX, it will spin out everything that you need, the virtual center, etc. So just to show you that this is how this looks. And then I want to, because this takes a little bit of time, but in, ultimately in the whole session, we're going to take that vanilla SDVC that we've used a code base to deploy anyway, and we're going to deploy an all-in-one Veeam server, but then we're also going to add on to that a dynamic, the, the ability to dynamically deploy and destroy Veeam components. So all in that 45 minutes, we can be up and, up and running from a Veeam perspective, as well as adding vSphere tags and profiling some of the workloads in our SDVC. So I just have to work out whether that works. So what this is is a Terraform script that will call on various different APIs, and we're going to get into the tools that we're using here. Um, if we jump back, and I'll just touch on the agenda. So I've kicked off that live demo. Hopefully everyone's still got their fingers and toes crossed for, the, for us and that that works. Niels is going to touch on a bit more around, so what does VMware on AWS mean from a Veeam perspective? Does it change anything that we have on premises or the traditional Veeam story that we have? Uh, I'm going to then touch in stuff around infrastructure as code, so life before, what, what it's like today for the majority of the room, right, is that this is the way we live our life. We, we deploy a template, we deploy our workloads, and that's how we play. But I'm, I kind of want to highlight the areas of infrastructure as a code that will change the way you look at how you deploy workloads within your environment. And it's not difficult. You don't have to be a developer with a beard. It does help, though. Um, then we're going to talk about a bit more, then hopefully that demo is still running and it's all good, and we're going to go into a bit more detail around what those modules look like and what they, what they give us. Uh, and then we're going to look at that from an end-to-end -end point of view. What, what have we done? What have we achieved from that automated? Um, then there's an announcement that we actually made in VMworld US, but I want to highlight that to, to you guys as well. So we'll get to that as well. But if Niels goes into the VMware Cloud on AWS first. All right. So, um, as Michael said, I think seven times already, we're leveraging uh, VMware Cloud and AWS. Um, I mean, I guess everybody has heard about it already. I mean, show of hands if you haven't. Don't be afraid. I won't throw anything. Maybe the guys at VMware will throw something. But, I mean, everybody has seen this, right? This is a recap of how VMware is now able to run on AWS. And you can extend your infrastructure from on-premises into AWS, leveraging the whole foundation of VMware on VMware Cloud on AWS. There are other sessions on this, so I'm not going to go deep dive much on it. I'm very sure that 
if you are in the interest area of this, you already signed up for the sessions on here. Um, I guess this morning on the keynote there was some talk about this. It's a hot topic, so we are leveraging it as well, combining it, of course, with Veeam for protecting the old infrastructure which you are running on VMware Cloud and AWS. Um, if I would get $1 for every time I say AWS, I would be rich at the end of the session, so donations are welcome. Thank you. So why do we combine Veeam and VMware on AWS? Just call it VMC, make it easier. First of all, familiarity. Knowing for those who have used Veeam and who know, of course, the Veeam backend replication, it's one single console, nothing new, exactly the same as we have it right now. Combine it, of course, with the vCenter in the software-defined data center, and you can get started. The other reason as well, flexibility. You can easily scale out, scale up as you grow. Based on the VMware infrastructure, you can add more Veeam components. You can increase the proxies. You can increase the repositories. Of course, you don't want to do this manually, and this is where we come in with this whole automation part, which is, according to the screen, still running and still going good. So those who are still crossing their fingers and toes, thank you for that. Trusted platform, leveraging existing technologies. vSphere has, or VMware has, great technology with vSphere. I mean, everybody in here is using it. We've got very amazing Veeam technologies, expanding it as we grow as well. And it just works. So if you are looking at leveraging VMC, know that if you want to use Veeam, you need Update 3 and Update 3A. But it's fully supported, fully verified, and qualified as well by VMware. Uh, we're among their uh, marketplace as well. So important in terms of backup and disaster recovery is, of course, 3 to one rule, meaning that you have three copies of your data. You have one which is your protection, one is your initial backup, and one is the copy of site. And this is where we will touch base as well, because within Veeam, we offer you a lot of possibilities of doing it. You can leverage either your own data centers and send across multiple locations. Now we've got the AWS story by VMware, so you can send data there as well. Or you can work with a local service provider who potentially runs in their data center, or maybe they leverage AWS as well. So basically, cloud is the limit, or cloud is, this, is as far as you can go, of course. Um, a lot of options in there which you can choose. Now you may wonder, well, why do I need availability? While AWS is big and while other clouds are very big, there is always need for availability. You have multiple locations. So you have, for example, AWS East and, and West. You can leverage them. You've got your own data centers. Um, I guess everybody in the room here is well aware of high availability within your organization. Um, there's a nice blog post. The slides on this will be provided later on as well, so you don't have to uh, write down the whole link. But it explains how uh, availability can be achieved within AWS as well. So quick recap, um, so we've got VMware, AWS, or VMware on AWS with Veeam. Better together, of course, that's why we're here, else we wouldn't be here. Um, it's truly software-defined data center. Um, makes sense, I guess. Took advantage of one single node, as uh, Michael already explained, and we'll jump back into it during the live demo, so you will actually see one node being leveraged. And what we did is we actually leveraged existing PowerCLI modules by VMware. Um, to show you how automation orchestration of Veeam works on the whole VMware infrastructure. Quickly, one of the print screens, so we leveraged existing PowerShell modules or PowerCLL mod models which were available already for VMware Cloud and AWS. So this is something we used because it's a community effect. Those who do, do automation, you will know that sharing is caring, right? If it exists, reuse it. Um, nobody's gonna reinvent the wheel unless you have plenty of time, which nobody has, of course. Um, so this is something we reused. Uh, these will also be available later on on GitHub. I mean, the whole code will be available or is already available. So if you are leaving the session, you say, okay, this is great, we wanna leverage this, you can just go on GitHub, download the code, run it, course, at your credentials, and then you're good to go. So Michael's going to jump back into the part of how life was before we had all this automation orchestration and the life before infrastructure as a code. I first just want to make sure that this is still running. So the, the screen print that you saw in that last slide that Niels put up was around how we deployed the SDDC. So it was, we used, we leveraged v, PowerCLI to actually go out to VMware and AWS and provision that. And I think the benefit of that VMware and AWS is that you guys as, as vSphere admins, as people that look after vSphere on a daily basis, it's exactly the same look and feel from a management perspective. You don't have to learn AWS or Azure or a, another different, a different world. You don't have to learn that. So 
that was that's really one of the key differentiators and, and reasons why we've done what we've done. So life before infrastructure as code, and that's kind of a, a bit of a, a wishy-washy way of saying some, some of the things that we're speaking to a lot of enterprises or a lot of large customers around, okay, so the, the systems that we deploy on a daily basis are, are tied, to the, tied to the hardware or tied to the infrastructure. And the, the way this is changing is, a, is, is taking that apart. And this is where infrastructure as code allows us to achieve more with that, that um, footprint. So rather than doing that, that manual provisioning and having to take that VM template that we have and deploy that 10 times for a particular ap application, let's take something that's, that is a repeated, repeated task and deliver that as part of code. So we take away that manual footprint so that we can be doing more interesting stuff rather than managing the deployment. So two big changes is that one, we're not just sat in our own on-premises world anymore with our vSphere environment. And there's so many other options that we have available, whether that be SaaS-based workloads, whether that be IaaS from a, a cloud provider that we just want to dip our toe in and maybe leverage for a um, dev and test type environment or DR, is we've got this offering where we can we can literally use and leverage other areas of, of a multi-cloud without using too much of a marketing buzzword, but we have multiple platforms and multiple offerings to be able to deploy different services and applications. So that's the first big change. So how, and, and obviously the challenge that comes with that is how do we manage that? And then two is because of that, the elasticity of being able to deploy an application server in AWS or in VMware and AWS or on-premises in VMware is we're changing away from that, the Star Wars names, uh, virtual machines that we had. I'm, I'm sure there's someone in the room that still has that as well, but I'm really going away from that, that pet to more of a cattle. We actually don't care about the actual server itself. That goes from a where, where we look after that for a month or a year or years, now down to weeks to, to potentially days and hours, is that we just need that to be there to serve its purpose and then it can go away and we'll just deploy a new one at that point and start leveraging that from that point of view. The, the important part is, is the data that we, that we want to be able to expose. So over on the, uh, the left-hand side is that big monolithic way we're going to deploy all of our virtual machines or our machines and they're going to have the, uh, the application set they're going to and they'll, they're going to live in our data center for months years and they're just going to probably maybe they'll grow maybe we'll deploy more maybe we'll but you never really delete a virtual machine right whereas over on the right hand side that gives us a, a bit more around scalability because from an infrastructure as code point of view it means that we can tone down those resources and only use what we need to use. So rather than deploying big, chunky virtual machines that we do on the left-hand side, we can be more granular in terms of, OK, what, what, does, what do we actually need to achieve? Let's be more dynamic around what we deploy. So a big part of infrastructure as code is around scale. And these next few slides is definitely highlighting around how it is today on the left-hand side but then also the art of the possible, what we can do from an infrastructure as code point of view. So then obviously that month end comes when things are busy and different environments have different use cases and peak capacity times. Over on the left hand side, we just continue with what we've got because we're probably at 70, 80% full and we've already got all of our workloads there that, that we're already leveraging. From an infrastructure as code point of view, if we know that the peak capacity time is X, Y, or Z within the month or within the week, we can dynamically deploy those different workloads using infrastructure as code. So that new world of being able to pick up or, or deploy that cattle menta mentality against those workloads is quite a, an efficient way of looking at the peak times within, within the business. And then obviously scale that back, and now we've got our subset of main workloads, but also that's repeatable. So if that workload changes or gets updated, 
then we can absolutely use infrastructure as code to be able to refresh that because we literally don't care what the name or the IP or even what the application is on that server. The data is the important bit, right? That's the static piece that we have. So with infrastructure as code, it means that that's a repeatable task. We take that, we make that once and then deploy it several times. So the lifespan of those VMs on the right-hand side now go down to weeks or even, even days. Whereas, again, on the left-hand side, we're looking after that same big giant of a virtual machine or set of virtual machines that we're having to just hope that we have to patch and, and make sure everything's good. So obviously there's three key reasons why we do this, and it's either gonna to be to mitigate risk within our infrastructure, if there's any infrastructure admins in the, in the room, obviously everything is about risk and how do we keep that infrastructure up, or how do we reduce costs, or how do we provide a better business outcome to our users or to our customers. And really that infrastructure as code being more dynamic and being more automated means that instead of every day having to deploy these new workloads, it means that we can be doing other things that are more exciting for us as well, right? We don't want to be deploying a VMware template, right click, deploy, give it a name, give it an IP, blah, blah, blah. It's quite kind of a boring and it should be more automated. So let's, you, let's leverage infrastructure as code from that point of view. So let's just check. I see some green, so that means things are working, right? So at this point, what we're doing here is, as I said, we're, we're deploying within, the, within that new SDVC, we're deploying a Veeam backup and replication server, an all-in-one server to begin with. We're leveraging our Windows template that we've pre-built, and we're now deploying. You can see that we're installing SQL and all of the other components with that. The exciting bit will, will come as, we, as that builds out and how we can be more dynamic. How do we leverage that infrastructure as code to be more dynamic when it comes to the availability of your, your workload? So infrastructure as code. So it doesn't mean you need to have a beard. It helps. Is there any, any developers in the room? You haven't got a beard, so. <laughs> See, that's proof right there. Um, so as I said about the application being decoupled away from that infrastructure, or being decoupled away from that hardware, that's a key thing that we, we, we need to be aware of is that, and, and I'm sure everyone in the room is having that, that situation. Virtualization kind of did that for us as well. Um, that routine of provisioning on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis of being able to go out and deploy those. And, also, rapid change management. Things are changing all the time within our infrastructure, whether that through acquisition, through different applications that we're using. How do we keep up with that from a, an administrator point of view? Rather than just putting a plaster on it, rather than just like getting by, let's be a little bit more dynamic around how do we manage that. Um, and then change management. Everyone probably in the room is, has dealt with some sort of change management, and, and the, the overhead that that brings and the, the time it takes to actually get things done, whereas actually the technology is there and allows us to do it, but the change management is a lot slower. So obviously from that is around increasing the speed, the reliability, it goes back to those three points that I just touched on around mitigating risk, reducing cost, and providing a better business outcome. So three things is that code, and again, you, we don't have to be developers at this point. So any of that infrastructure as code, and we'll get onto the tools that we're using and why, and, what, and why we're using it. But ultimately, it looks like a set of templates, but from a code point of view, it's going to provide the ability to deploy X application or Y application, and, or even machine X, Y, and Z. Like the, it's, it's a way of being able to deploy faster, but in a controlled configuration or configured management um, scenario. So biggest reasons is why do I want to do that repeated work? Let's just code it. Um, and you know exactly what that looks like then from a, being able to manage version controls and being able to update that, we've got that ability to have that in front of us. And then from that point of view, you don't have the sprawl of different VMs being built by different areas of the business. So it's, there's more control, more reliability, it's repeatable, and again, it goes back to that cat, uh, cattle and not pets point of view. 
So there's four different ways that we can look at infrastructure's code, and we may leverage all of them. In our, in our instance, we do leverage every single point of these, but any one of these could, could fall into that infrastructure's code. And one could be just a way of scripting something to automate a process, make things better, make things faster, make mo things more efficient. When you get into configuration management, this is where we need to keep a control on the versions. This is where we want to actively deploy several different uh, tool sets or applications in one bundle to, to be able to push out. Templating. Now, this could be the same as creating a VMware template within our infrastructure, but ultimately, how do we automate that fashion? How many people have in the room that have created a, a Windows template and you have to keep going back to that every three, six months and you're then doing, running a Windows update or it's losing its license arm and things like that. And this is really taking that away is that, okay, we don't have to do that. We can leverage tools that we have within the community, within the open source community to be able to deploy from scratch a, a, new, a new virtual machine running the latest version of Windows or, or Linux or any distro. And then how do we provision that? How do we, what's the, what's the driving, the automated provisioning around that? So just some of the, some of the tools that are out there, um, we're gonna get into what we use, but this is more of an overview, is from a script, how many people have played with PowerCLI in the room? So PowerCLI, Power PowerShell, Bash, configuration management, how many people have played with one of those on the, on the screen? So less numbers, but so Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Saltstack, they all have their differentiators with, depending on the workload, depending on the application that you're, that you're using. Templating, so has anyone in the room used Packer at all? So this is where I'm going with that, that whole build a, build a new template from scratch, build a new workload from scratch, being able to take just an ISO and deploy a new virtual machine from that. Cloud formation from an AWS point of view also gives the same or similar um, outcomes. And then provisioning, Vagrant, Terraform, all come from HashiCorp, all open source and the ability. So we, we're using Terraform to really bundle various different scripts together that allows us to do what we're doing as part of that. Still. Um, yeah, so a big, big part of this is the reusability. So if you're a company that is doing something the same thing over and over again, whether that be every month or every six months or every quarter, then infrastructure as code is something that we, you, you should be looking at. And again, you don't have to be a developer. You don't have to know a coding language. You don't, that, I'm not, I have no idea when it comes to writing code, but I can get by a little bit in things like PowerCLI and PowerShell. But then another important factor to that is the version control. So if you did have various different departments or environments, then we can use infrastructure as code to now really dynamically deploy the same version or the same controller version in those different environments. So, and it will just really reduce that overhead that you're having around deploying that. Oh, so it's still me. So now we get into why, why, why did we do what we did, right? So this started, uh, this started maybe 12 months ago. I was speaking to a guy called Jeremy Goodrum. He is, he is a legit DevOps guy. He, uh, yeah, he does have a beard. So the why, what, what, what was our challenge? Why did we set out to do something? And really it was around, okay, so, we have to install Veeam. And v Veeam is not a difficult installation, right? It's seven clicks, next, next, next. You point it to a SQL server, you point it to a database, and ultimately then you can start protecting your virtual machines. Anyone in the room that is a Veeam customer, how easy, like, show of hands if it's easy to install, right? So we're really, that's not the challenge that we're facing, but think about from an SE point of view, they're going in for the proof of concept and they're gonna install Veeam, and the customer is then reliant on, he has to go and deploy his own Windows template. He has to then make sure he's got the right version of SQL that he wants to use, blah, blah, blah. 
What this allows us to do is keep it very repeatable, keep it very version controlled in terms of being able to deploy exactly the same footprint in various different locations. So we're obviously leveraging infrastructure as code and what we're going to see by the end of this session, as long as everyone's kept their fingers and toes crossed, is we're going to see a fully deployed Veeam deployment leveraging a certain few different tools that I kind of touched on in the last slide in our VM, VMware on AWS environment. But ultimately that code base is portable, it's open source, it's available on GitHub today. Anyone can go and deploy this. And there's a few more cool things that we're gonna, we're gonna touch on. Next. So some of the use cases for us, I, I, so I mentioned around the proof of concept, fast deployment, rapid configuration. That's exactly what we wanted, but it's the, repeatable, it's the same. For every SE that goes out, we want them to be leveraging the same code base, the same installation steps, et cetera. Service providers, any service providers in the room? Okay, so all about reducing the, the footprint within your data center, being more dynamic around the, the resources that you're leveraging. So it was around how do we scale up, scale down our Veeam components within our, our service provider? And we'll get to that. But also enterprise. Enterprises have exactly the same or large environments. Um, they have the same requirement, very similar to a service provider. We don't want to waste, uh, going back to those last slides around over on the left, I said about those virtual machines, they're going to stay the same and they're going to be there for months, they're going to be there for years. Over on the right, we're being more dynamic, we're going to be able to reduce the, the payload because we're not necessarily now paying our virtual machines on a, we're not, it's not a CapEx model all the time. It could be operational and it could be charged on the hour. So let's only use the resources that we need at, at any given time. So without going into all the wordy, wordy points is that obviously I touched on how life is before infrastructure as a code. Everyone in the room has probably gone through that deploying a VMware template and now repeat that 10,000 times and repeat that every week or repeat that every day and that starts to get a bit of a daunting task and no one really wants to do that. <clears throat> so over to Niels for the tools of the trade. All right. So now let's go into the good part, right? Everything is going well. Still fine. I mean, the yeah, whole... still going. He did his marketing share. So. Um, so which tools did we use? So you saw a few of things that are optional out there and, 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 and in terms of provisioning, et cetera. Um, everything in this being used is PowerShell, PowerCLI, of course, to do the whole part on SDCC, uh, on AWS, I mean, Terraform, Chef, and of course, some Bash in there. Now you may wonder, but I've got zero experience on Chef or Terraform. How does that work? I mean, I've heard about it, I've never seen it. That's the cool thing about all this all-in-one deployment. So if you go onto the GitHub page where it's available, uh, we'll share it later on, you can download it. It's a predefined package and it will download everything for you. So basically when we install the servers, we will install a Chef server taking care of all the cookbooks and everything. So you don't have to learn anything of this. It's just one PowerShell script. You type it in, you say what you want to configure, Bam, it runs. So as you've seen at the start of the session, we had like this one liner and it's running. It's still running, uh, I think. Yeah, no, it is. It's still running. <laughs> um, and that's the cool thing Promise. about this. And as Michael said, it's portable. So if you use this in your main data center for your initial installment, it's great. If you have multiple locations, you can take this, go over there, no problem. If you're a service provider or if you're a partner and you're delivering Veeam and VMware services, these tools make your job a lot easier. It's not only about Veeam deployment, but think about also about VMware deployment. I mean, everybody here has probably installed TSXI a million times already, and it's every time the same thing. You put it in a USB stick, or if somebody still uses a CD-ROM, whatever, um, it's next, next, and you're good to go, right? This makes your job a lot more easier. These tools are made for that, so have a look at it, but our script basically provisions everything for you by leveraging one rule on one line. So what we do is we deploy a Veeam backup replication infrastructure, meaning we install a Veeam backup replication server, we add some proxies, we add some repositories, then we go into AWS and we configure the Veeam infrastructure in there, of course, and what we also do is the configuration of all the components, even extending it into a service provider view, which you'll see later on as well. What we will get in the end is three parts. So you have a service provider who offers Cloud Connect. 
you've got an on-premise infrastructure, and then of course we got our VMware Cloud on AWS, where we have the whole infrastructure. Well, that dot isn't really useful, but um, imagine I'm pointing on the left part of the screen, um, where you have your VPCs and everything which is in AWS. So if you're not that familiar with AWS or virtual private uh, consoles and networking, your management, etc., and this is where we will go. And in between, we have a VMPN, which is a free uh, solution from us, which will take care of connectivity in between all of those things as you want, making everything more secure. Uh, because you don't want to send, well, you don't want to send your data over a public network and, you know, up for grabs. Hey, Mr. Hacker, have fun with it. Uh, you don't want to do that, right? So, end to end auto orchestration automation part one. What we do is we deploy the Veeam infrastructure by deploying the Veeam back replication server. How do we do this? We deploy a virtual machine, we, in, we download the installation file, we install, install everything and all the dependencies, talking about SQL Server, talking about uh, IAS, et cetera, et cetera. You know, for those who have installed Veeam, we've got this prerequisite button where it says check now and install now, all done before you by leveraging PowerShell. We upgraded to the latest installation because by default it will be update 3 and we've got 3A, so we'll update it as well. And then, of course, we deploy the proxies and repositories so you can make your backups of your virtual infrastructure on AWS. How do we do it? We leverage Chef um, for all, this, all of this. So Chef is something that uses cookbox, cookbooks, and in those cookbooks you have the configuration of what you want to leverage. So if you want to make multiple proxies, just use that one, or if you want to make multiple proxies, it's just one or two lines and you're up and running. Um, we leverage our Veeam APIs by leveraging PowerShell um, in Veeam Backend Replication to make it easy, and we can combine that with Chef because Chef allows you to call PowerShell as well. The Veeam Cookbook is freely available as well, um, and it breaks out all of those components. So you can actually say, I want to deploy, let's say, five proxies and only two, two repositories, Whatever ID you want, whatever will fit your infrastructure, we can leverage the book and everything is up and running. Yeah, still going. Still going, <laughs> still good, all right. And the advantage here is that you can grow in your footprint. As your company grows, you just go back into the cookbook, you modify one or two things, you hit one additional button and you're up and running. And this is where the part comes easy, because imagine that if you have to deploy an additional proxy, how does it normally go? You deploy a Windows machine, you have to install a license, you have to potentially install Windows updates, then you have to deploy the component. While we are pretty fast, it may take up to 30 minutes. While with this, you just do it in two minutes, you hit one button, you wait 30 minutes, of course, while you can get a coffee or you know, do other things, and you're up and running. So this is where all these tools of trade come in, in place and make your job a lot more easy. Um, I'm very sure that your boss will love it as well because you can spend time on other things as well. So the return on investment is good as well. So quick overview how it works. So you have got a chef supermarket. Uh, what's in the name? You know, marketplace, supermarket, um, which will download those cookbox, cookbooks onto your chef, chef server. You got a client onto your virtual machine taking care of everything. And you'll know that in our example, we deploy a Windows 2016 server with the latest VMBAC replication and all the components installed on that. Can be fully modified as you want. This is just how Chef uh, in this example works, but you can leverage other ones such as Puppet or Ansible or Salt, whatever is preferred. So what is this short thing? It's a fast distributed deployment, making sure that your operating system is configured, meaning you have the latest updates in Windows, you have maybe firewall rules if you want to go to the next level, um, potentially you know, permissions on people who can log on, uh, application configuration, the same there. So if you deploy VMBAC replication and you do it multiple times, you'll have multiple SQL servers. Maybe you have the same rule for SQL in there. The advantage here, it's all in one cookbook, which is a text file in the end, and everything is pre-configured. Instead of having to write down everything for those, imagine you have to maintain 50 different environments or 50 different locations. Um, I'm pretty good at remembering passwords and stuff, but remember, remembering 50 different passwords or 50 different IPs, becomes a hard task, then you're going to, of course, say, well, I've still got Excel and I can save it in there. I mean, who still uses Excel nowadays, right? Um, but the advantage is you can spin it up and down when it's needed. So you can spin up a location and then maybe you move it, you don't need it anymore, just click one button and it will be automatically destroyed as well. Um, you can also go there and power everything down manually, but this is central management makes it much more easy. Europe. So, yeah, just to add on to 
this piece is so okay if you're if you're a smaller environment and necessarily not looking at infrastructure as code elsewhere for your applications all we're really showing is the art of the possible from a how flexible veeam from a, a software point of view is but so out of the box we can deploy an all in one um, all in one management server veeam backup and replication proxies and a repository all in one we can do that the likelihood is is that you're probably not going to use that you're not going to use infrastructure's code really to to deploy that where the infrastructure's code really gets exciting is when it gets down to these proxy server builds so the lifting and shifting of data from a to b by being able to dynamically deploy those and dynamically destroy those and add them into the management server as data movers that's where that gets kind of interested in that we can scale up scale down but dynamically we can add that we can even add the infrastructure's code at the back end of a backup job to say okay I, I, before before we start that backup job i want to spin up 10 20 100 proxies and they're all going to go concurrently from that workstation build that we showed here is that we're going to bootstrap all of those concurrently up and that's one thing i'm going to show once that finishes um, but ultimately the, the ability to deploy dynamically deploy those proxies to suit that backup window that we we need to we need to achieve but then as soon as that finishes we run another script that then pulls all of them down because ultimately that's cattle we don't care about them we don't we're not going to name them after star wars characters we're not going to name them after simpsons characters we're just going to get rid of them because we don't care and then next backup window we're going to deploy them again we're going to deploy brand new so it means that they're going to be the latest patch they're going to be the latest updates they're going to be tried and tested from that point of view and we can spin them up and use them and then get rid of them because that's ultimately what we want to be able to achieve and hopefully there you can start to see the use case from a service provider point of view but also from a from a, a an enterprise a large scale environment is how do we dynamically deploy it and not only those large enterprises and service providers are looking at apis they're looking at ways to automate process and this is really where okay we're highlighting what we're doing here about deploying us as part of that infrastructure as code but you're probably already using infrastructure as code to deploy application sets and deploying different workloads within the within the environment so as soon as this does finish which i think we've got another minute before fingers crossed everyone needs to keep their fingers crossed at this point so within our just to break down that that slide that neil's touched on so within our vmware and aws our sdvc that we've deployed we're now going to see a veeam backup and replication server and what i'm going to do is then trigger dynamically the creation of two dynamic proxies that is going to obviously go out concurrently it's going to go and spin up two new windows machines it's going to make sure that the transport service is installed the proxy service and it's then going to add that to veeam backup and replication and then in theory you could dive into that veeam backup and replication server and you could start protecting machines using that those proxies so if we jump over so it's still running it is live so hopefully that finishes but if we already if we go over to that vcenter that we initially looked at is that you'll see up the top there we have sdvc hyphen vbr01 so that's now a fully deployed up to date using the latest template using that packer packer um, build and at the moment that's now going through and installing those those veeam components and such within that so yeah that fingers crossed that that should be any time now you see the last thing that we did was around uh upgrading so the benefit of this is that so from a, a veeam update point of view we have a regular cadence of updates so i mean last year last christmas we released update 3 we've had update 3a that gave us platform support for vSphere 6.7 and we're going to have update 4 coming shortly what that means that we can leverage this cookbook or this terraform script to be able to now stage those restores and keep things up to date or decide not to upgrade and just have that that lockstep version control of our veeam environment as well as our uh, it's as if yeah. okay so so yeah basically what i was saying is is 
We've installed the core components, so Veeam 9.5, so the latest version. Then we're going to perform the upgrade within because it's not slipstreamed into the code, but that's a different session, different story. And now we're going to reboot that machine and we're going to come back in and we're going to make sure that everything is, is running as it should be. That, to go back on to what Niels said as well, so we've already developed and gone a little bit further in that we're using, that's good, that's a good sign. Um, um, we're, so we're using the, this all-in-one PowerShell script that pulls those three modules together. The, one, the first one, that first module is what we've covered around installing the Veeam components, the all-in-one server. The next one is what Niels is going to touch on is around AWS. The next one is around how do we now make it more behavior-based? How do we do more? How, how can we be more policy-driven within our environment to start protecting those workloads? Hopefully that connects because that you can see at the moment that, uh, yeah. So the next iteration of the code base is, so at the moment we're using Hosted Chef, so obviously you need to have a Hosted Chef account. You can, if you're a Chef user, you could, could have Chef hosted on your, in your infrastructure and manage it that way. But the new iteration of this code base is that we could use something called No Chef or Chef Solo. And that allows us to, literally, you don't need to worry about Chef. You don't, you don't anyway but we don't need to have any third party or connectivity into that hosted chef or chef on premises. So that's the next iteration. We're using the older co code base because I know it works. It, well, fingers crossed it works. So what we're doing now is, so we've, uh, we've upgraded the machine and we've rebooted after the update and now we're going back in and we're putting various different uh, update packages into that. And any second now, this should finish, he says and allow us to then kick on to that next module. So if, for example, I was to jump into this machine, now I don't know what I've clicked and I'm nervous. <laughs> Okay, so just to go back to here, we can see that we've created one of our components. For those at the back, you might not be able to see it too well, but, and then we've got the VBR host at IP address X. So, but you can see in, if this works. It's, oh, there you go. We only had to say it seven times, but it's okay. I was in the zone. <laughs> there we go. This is where the password, yeah, there we go. So ultimately what you're gonna see, and we'll come back to this anyway as we walk through the rest of it. So what Niels is gonna to touch on is the next module which is deploying stuff within within AWS, so where we ultimately protect those virtual machines. Although they're still in AWS, they're out of band. If anything was to happen to that VMware and AWS infrastructure that we have, we have a backup out externally from that, adhering to that 321. So you can see here, so you saw at the start, we didn't have this machine, we've deployed it. We haven't really, we've gone back and looked at it a few times, but ultimately we haven't had to interact at all into this. This is deployed the V management console, the proxy deployment, the SQL server, and everything that go, all of the, um, the dependencies that we have within, within Veeam, it's deployed those. The license file as well is part of something called a chef data bag. So they use these acronyms very much, obviously, around chef and cooking. Um, the data bag is where we can put things like a license file that could be repeatedly used every single time. So here we can see it's a very basic, bland uh, Veeam installation. It's got its license file on there. And ultimately, we're going to come back to this shortly when... Do you want me to click? That's fine. In fact, let me just... <laughs> so 
there I've just said about, okay, I want that part of that script, so hidden away, is I've said I want to dynamically deploy two additional proxies within our environment. So that's going to then concurrently go away and allow us to do that. This next point is where, uh, where Niels will jump in. Touch into that, yeah. So, so we're going to let this run, um, the next part, so we can jump back. That doesn't take as long, so we will finish before the, we will finish. the session. So we've done part one, which is deploying a Windows template with VMware replication. And as you've seen, one command, instead of, I don't know, 15 clicks, I don't know how long it takes to deploy a template nowadays, but that's the whole goal. Of course, as Michael said, you've got now your VMware infrastructure up and running. You've got virtual machines in there. You need to protect those. That's good, we, right? We, we installed VMware replication in there. But according to this plan right now, we're making the backup within AWS. So if the region goes down, your SDC is down, but also your VM backups are not available. So how do we fix this? And this is actually where, so we've deployed AWS and Veeam infrastructure. But what we are going to do is we add additional networking within AWS. We will create a Linux repository on an EC2 instance. We deploy VMPN for additional layer of security. And then actually we are going to connect that VMPN to the extended network and make backups outside of our virtual data center within AWS. So with this, you have backups within AWS, but outside of the standard infrastructure which you're using. In case something goes wrong, you can still recover from it. So we've got our instance with a VPC Internet Gateway, VMPN, and a Linux repository on there as well, which is being deployed right now, I guess. Yeah, it's happening. It's happening. I see some Linux stuff happening, so that's good. Um, so basically, we're deploying a Linux instance right now, which is going to serve as a repository to sending backups to, but it's also serving as a VMPN, so it's both two-in-one, so actually uh, networking can happen in between. And where we're actually going to go is you have your infrastructure here, and you will notice that we can send backups from, in this case, US East 1 to US West 1, as an example. Of course, you can specify within the Chef Cookbook or in the Terraform code, I mean, wherever you want to put it. Uh, we're in Europe, so if you want to put it in Europe, it's fine. You can even go from Europe to America. You define it, go crazy as you want. We can support it. And of course, once that has been configured, we'll go back. And what we will do is Veeam Backup Replication will be updated. Um, so I see that the Linux is still, it's still being installed, so I'll continue a little bit about the story. Linux is being installed, the repository is being done, but at the moment, at this current stage, we don't have the repository in Veeam Backup Replication. But that's fine, because in our Chef Cookbook, what we do is we go back into Veeam Backup and Replication, we first add the vCenter, so we can see all the virtual machines and all the storage and all the things we need. We're going to add a service provider, but that's for the next step. We're going to configure the Linux repository, which we just created, create some backup jobs based on vSphere tags. I mean, everybody's using tags nowadays as well. So we leverage those tags, and we create backup jobs, which are going to be backed up within the uh, AWS instance. So it's still being deployed, I guess? Yeah, it's still going. Um, yeah, I think to the point of that last, so those three modules, that last one that we were on, they're obviously all manual steps that we go through. Just in time. Um, add in the vCenter, it's not difficult. We give it a, an IP address or a, a DNS name, and we add it. Yeah, now you can talk about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and then creating the vSphere tag. Again, not every environment is the same. We may want to change what those different SLAs are to those virtual machines and how much we protect them. But ultimately, what we're doing is bringing everything together. We haven't really, I've shown you guys how we can get into that Veeam backup and replication console, but I've done nothing in there. So within here, you can see that we're now adding. So we've created that Linux EC2 instance, and we've, we're now adding that into our Veeam backup and replication server within VMware and AWS. What we're also going to do is we're going to take one of our service providers, our Cloud Connect, where potentially they're offering that Cloud, Cloud Connect backup as a service offering, and we'll add that as a repository. We could also add that as a DR, so replication as a service as well, as well as that on-premises on production piece. So here we go. We're just adding that Cloud Connect. We've obviously put that into our variables um, file, 
and we've added in our credentials and where we're going to get that Cloud Connect provider from. We're going to add that in. This is where Anthony said that took a while. So, yes, so it's just... um, but really, this is where we're obviously going to get to the piece where this is where you can start using this and you can start get like protecting that data. So the final picture, and we'll go back to that hopefully when that, when that finishes, is we've got, now we've got a dynamic way of provisioning VM, Veeam within VMware and AWS. And within that, we've got the dynamic provisioning and destroy of proxies within that environment. Ultimately, that's portable. That could be any VMware environment anywhere. The code base is exactly the same. We just change the variables. There's about 10 variables that we can change, and ultimately, we're asking for vCenter administrator, or we're asking where that template resides within the infrastructure, like folder location, etc. It's not difficult to be able to change that. Then we've deployed the uh, VPN, which has given us the overall network connectivity between the sites, uh, as well as a Linux repo within AWS, uh, an EC2 instance in there. We've already got our, our Veeam repository that sits on premises, so our disk there. We've also got this Cloud Connect provider that we, that we have. And we're all, all we're doing is automating that deployment, but also the configuration of that. Um, so obviously, the trains of backup allows us to send our backups out to our Cloud Connect providers. It allows us to send back home on premises or the other way around as well, if need be. It also, in this instance, we're using VPN. Now, this is not necessarily the most efficient way because obviously we're going out to the internet and then back in. And AWS allows for something called ENI, which allows for the elastic network interface to, to connect internally. So that would be the most efficient way of moving data from that back, Veeam backup and replication into that EC2 instance. How are we looking for? It's still going. Still going. <laughs> okay, so we've already mentioned around this being community driven. So it's completely out there, it's, it's available. We use the run all, but if we did just want to deploy that VBR all in one, we've got that option, that trigger as part of that PowerShell script. This is available on GitHub today. I urge anyone, go and play with it. There's probably a lot of smarter people than me in, in the room, and you can really develop this. It's open source, we're not, it's, it's completely there. Um, I have to, big shout outs to Jeremy Goodrum, who's the guy who knows Chef, he's the DevOps guy, Matt Alford as well from, from Australia, and a few other community sites that we, that we have down there. The announcement that we made at, at uh, VMworld in the US was around being in the VMware and AWS. So I mentioned around cloud formation. As part of the mar marketplace piece, we've got the ability to now automatically and dynamically deploy a Veeam component within VMware and AWS. And that runs through a very simple way of wizard to be able to deploy a very simple infrastructure around Veeam. So it uses cloud formation, you fill in certain details, and it's very easy to run through that, and ultimately it gives you that same scenario that we've been talking about. That's only in VMware and AWS. So wrapping it up, again, it's available already on the Chef Supermarket, so you can go and download that and have a look. Um, we leverage the Veeam PowerShell reference massively in that, so from an API perspective, as well as the API references. If you wanted to get that Veeam Terraform scripts, then we have a QR code there. If, I'll leave that up for a second. That's still taking ages to add that. We'll carry on. We've got five minutes. So. I'll let everyone take a picture of that if need be. So yeah, ultimately that's where you're gonna be able to get that all-in-one PowerShell script, as well as the, all the Terraform scripts that go along, along with that. Then, more importantly, so Veeam Party is I think it's tonight. I've lost track of what day it is. Um, hopefully everyone's registered. And if not, then drop by the booth and see what, see what the, the, the people on the booth can do. But ultimately, we've changed locations. It's gonna be a pretty, pretty mad one over, over there tonight. And some sh shameless plugs is, if you wanna hear about update four, what's coming next, what's coming in the future from Veeam. Anton's got a session tomorrow at two. So everyone should be up bright 
an early to, to be able to see that or a lay in to be able to see that. And he's going to be touching on some of the new stuff that's coming around data labs. So being the ability to leverage that data. He's going to be talking about some of the stuff around Veeam 1 and Veeam 1 gets a lot of intelligence that gets push, pushed into that as well as cloud mobility. So moving data, moving workloads around. Shameless plug, if you wanted to know more about that chef piece, so over in the US I did a V brown bag, a, like a 25 minute session on what that cookbook looks like and how it, how it plays out. And we did an end to end demo of actually looking at the chef piece. So that's available on YouTube. Sorry? Yeah, you see, I had a DevOps beard there. So, <laughs> um, this week, so today at quarter past two, not related to Terraform or automation, we're going to be looking at some of the features that we have on the truck today within Veeam. And we're going to hopefully not get sued by any uh, JK Rowling or anyone around that. But ultimately, we're going to touch on some, some video demos of, of that piece. Neil's also has a session. Yours is not on the 6th at no, quarter past so my, five. Mine is tomorrow. Um, and it's about how to not have a massive outage and get fired, AKA how to be the hero of your company. Um, so it's about 12 minutes how you can save your ass when something goes wrong. Um, <laughs> might be interesting to join. Um, and on top of that, we'll switch yeah. back in a second. If you have more questions, etc., um, we also have sessions on our Veeam boot. If you have questions about this session or on the whole chef part, or you missed a link, or you just want to chat with us, I mean, we're not we're not hostile people. Just come to us. Um, this is our boot. Just come say hi. Um, if you want to get in on tonight on the party, just go to the boot. The team there can help you get a, a, a ticket or, or get in, of course. Um, and that, with that, I guess we're just going to make one switch back into the yeah and. Uh, as well, the people, if you can fill out that survey, it's important that we know whether we're doing a good job, whether it was interesting. If you did like it, then I'm Michael Cade. If you didn't, then I'm Niels Engelen. Seriously? Um, <laughs> just to like, wrap this up, though, so you can see in there that we've got the VBR server. You can see them dynamically deployed proxies. And just for, for effect, you can see that they are running Windows the time is even different, which is interesting. Um, it's still adding those. But if we then jump into that VBR server, yeah. it's rebooted, so you need to open it again. Yeah. Here we go. There you go. So you can start to see that it's been packed out a little bit here. Um, if we go into inventory and we go to Repositories. Oh, backup infrastructure. Uh, backup infrastructure and repositories. I only work here. Um, you got so you saw there that the vCenter, but here is the Cloud. Linux EC2 instance that we is that the yeah, that's the EC2. Yep. Um, and then we're currently adding this service provider in that I don't believe is popular. One's, one's gone in but the other one hasn't. Um, but I think, obviously, from a 45-minute or an hour demo, is we haven't touched any of that. We've been able to speak to you about the benefits of infrastructure as code, um, all the benefits of, of what we can achieve. And it's not a scary world to, to just dip your toe in. Just have a look at what Terraform is and, and, yeah, and see where it can make your life easier in, within your business, I think. With that, yeah, if there's any questions, we'll, be, we'll head back to the booth now. But yeah, thank you very much for, for coming this morning, guys. Thank you.